Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. Given the subject matter of what we're going to talk about today, I just want to say if you or someone you know needs help now, call Lifeline on 13 1114. If you saw today's guest walking down the street, you would think of him as a hard man. It's written all over his face. He is a hard man, but at certain stages of his life, he was fighting his own demons and thought that suicide might just be the answer to his problems. As a young man, he had an intense, action-filled career in the Queensland Police. During that time, he hid his fears and insecurities by throwing himself into as much action that policing provides with total disregard for his own personal safety. You'll be amazed at some of the things he saw and did as a police officer. But our guest's public persona of being a tough, unbreakable cop was really just masking some internal demons. As you know on I Catch Killers, we love stories of redemption. Usually it's bad guys who have turned their lives around. But today, thanks to our guest's honesty and courage, we're going to see redemption from another side. Today's guest had enough insight into his own behaviours to realise his life was going off the rails. At his lowest point, he spent three nights in a row with a loaded Glock pistol, laying in bed, trying to think of reasons not to end his life. Eventually he reached out and sought help, and was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. He has got his life together, he has a successful career in private industry, away from the police, He's written a book and is trying to help others by sharing what he learned in turning his own life around. I've gotten to know today's guest pretty well, and I like what he's doing with his life. Sean O'Gorman, welcome to I Catch Killers. Thanks, Gary. Pleasure to be here. So, what are you up to these days? Mate, uh, a lot of different things. Recently, just uh, I was out of the army a couple of days ago, do a lot of stuff with uh, soldiers at soldier recovery centres. Fair bit yep. of stuff with police, corporates, a whole lot of different things. Yeah, so you really uh, you, you've been out of the police for a while, but you've still got that connection and uh, helping people yeah, in mate, that environment. I've been out about twenty years, but that's uh, yeah, big drive for me is actually want to help people and have an impact. Yeah, try and make a difference to people. Yeah. I, I think people uh, would be surprised what you see in uh, in a career in the cops, and uh, I've been or I've been uh, reading your book, My Dark Companion, mm -hmm. and there was. Uh, one particular uh, scene or, or incident that you described, and I, I think it was uh, at Fortitude Valley. Yes, mate. And, and su suicide by cop. It was a pretty heavy scene. It, it's like something out of the movies. Do you want to um, tell the listener that just to give a sense of the type of things that you can be confronted with? In For a sure. Mate, uh, it was a long time ago, about 1994. I was 24 years of age. I was working a um, 4 to 12 shift on a Monday night. And if uh, for your listeners who understand Brisbane or know Brisbane, the Fortitude Valley Mall, Brunswick Street's a really busy part of, of Brisbane. I was a, a little way out of town near the Royal Brisbane Hospital when a call came over from a detective car calling urgent that they were in pursuit, which wasn't unusual. But then seconds later, their call was that they, there were shots fired. So they were screaming on the radio. The, the bad guys had shot the windows out on their car, one of the windows out. So I, uh, as silly as it might sound, as a 24-year-old kid, really, that was what I'd live for that sort of action and that yeah. sort of job in the police. So I drove there as fast as I possibly could. Um, you were like a moth to the bright light. A hundred percent, yeah, because that's what, you know, I, I do a lot with soldiers and police and that sort of personality, that's what we joined the police to do was those yeah. sort of jobs, right? So I, I went there, I went uh, through the Brunswick Street Mall at about 70 kilometres an hour. There were people diving into restaurants off tables thinking I was going to run them over out the top of the mall and down Brunswick Street, which is a major sort of thoroughfare. And as I crested the uh, the top of a hill coming down towards an intersection um, with Merthyr Road, there was a vehicle coming up the hill and it was absolutely like a scene in the movie and it, and it slowed yeah. down. There was six or seven police cars. The offender's vehicle was at the front of the line of them and there was one of the offenders was sitting on the windowsill of the car with his the top half of his body outside the vehicle with a rifle, a two four three rifle on the roof and he was firing shots back at the pursuing police. So it sort of took me a minute to really understand what was happening. It took me a second to understand what was happening. And when we talk about things slowing down, that's exactly mm. what happened. I did a quick sort of calculation. I was doing about 130 kilometers an hour at the time, and I thought I was going to ram their vehicle, but I thought that would kill me and them. I didn't care about them, but I didn't want to die, obviously. So I pulled over and stopped. And as they went past me, they were probably four or five meters from me, and the offender turned and fired three shots at me very close. Yeah. Missed me, missed the car, I don't know how. And even though I was terrified, I was really scared, I was really angry. So I, I did a U-turn and overtook six of the seven pursuing police cars, got in behind the first vehicle with a male and female general duties uniform police in it, 
and I was trying to get around them to use a pit manoeuvre, which we never got taught, but I saw it on cops. So I thought that I thought that would work perfectly. <laughs> so, uh, that that fills in the gaps that the police academy doesn't. Do, exactly so, right. Yeah. Yep. So and I couldn't get past them because they were swerving from side to side. And at the time, I thought. I wish they'd stop playing games because I've got to get around them and do this job. But they were trying to make themselves a harder target. So the pl- police car in front of you, behind the offender's vehicle, yep. like they were swerving going to, side to yeah, side because yeah. he was he was firing. firing at them. He'd put there was twenty four rounds in their vehicle, twenty four bullets, twenty four shots, twenty four bullets in their vehicle. So they're just the ones that, that he hit them with. That, that's amazing. Yeah, that uh, they they didn't get hit. Absolutely, yeah. there was a female passenger. She was calling the pursuit, and she had actually ducked down into the footwell with her head looking over the dashboard. Yeah trying to make herself a smaller target. One of the rounds took the headrest out where she was sitting. So if she hadn't have ducked down, she would have been killed. Yeah. So it's pretty full on. That's about as full on as you get, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And and it was a it was a very strange feeling because I was certainly very scared, but there was just a, de- a determination, which I think all police feel, to go, someone's got to stop these guys. And mm-hmm. if it's not us, who's it going to be? And I had a real fear of them getting to that mall where there was people in restaurants and whether you know it might be a, a mass shooting, like who knows? So it, I didn't get around the first police car and the offender's vehicle crashed at the top of the pedestrian mall and it crashed. The first police car got through and then there was a big light pole fell. And as it fell, my car, I tried to drive over it. My car got caught up on it. Right. So as, I, as that was all happening, it all happened in, in seconds. The offenders were getting out of their vehicle with a rifle. I don't remember getting out of my car, but I got out and we had revolvers at that stage. So it was about yeah. as useful. I should have thrown it at them as yeah. trying to shoot them with it. But as I jumped out of the car, I was so focused on them, I forgot to take my police dog with me, Khan, which would have been pretty handy. Right. Um, so it was them running down the mall, me on foot, the two police in, in the uniform car, and then all the other police vehicles were going around the block because they couldn't get through. So it was just the five of us. And as I was running down the mall, the, the two offenders, they, they had two rifles in the vehicle. They only had one with them at this point. Okay. The, um, the driver had the rifle and he was – turning around, pointing it at me constantly, and I couldn't shoot because there was too many people behind him. Yeah. And I was trying to hide behind things. What time, time of day was it? 11 p.m. Right, okay. 11 yep. o'clock Monday night. Yep. And it was just one of those things. I was like, holy shit, this, like, it's surreal, but at the same time, that's what I joined the police to do. Yeah. Chased them down the mall, ran the corner onto Wickham Street, and they went down one block and they stopped. By this stage, there was probably 15 police cars coming from everywhere, as you can imagine. Yeah. And they were sort of boxed in under an awning. And the driver was looking around. Uh, one of the police officers took a shot at him and missed him and broke a big plate glass window. And I was walking in on them, so I had no cover. I was on the intersection on the street. Yeah. And I was walking with my with my weapon cocked and I was calling out, police, sir, would you put your weapon down? And I, was, I wasn't saying that at all. I was using every profanity and every bit of I, uh, putrid language I could I, think of. I know we'd all like to think that, uh, yeah, you can be very descriptive in situations like that when, yes, the, when exactly. the pressure's on, but uh, understandable. So and you, you're, you're how far away? Are the oh. offen- so you got these armed offenders, um, one firearm they got now, but yep. they've shown that they are more than willing to fire at, at police. Absolutely. They got a rifle, you've got a, a revolver, Yep. Uh, which is a bit of a disadvantage. Bit of a mismatch, yep. How far away were they from you? Oh, metres, mate. Four or five meters, six really? meters, maybe. Okay. Maybe a little bit more at the first, maybe ten or twelve meters at the first stage. But I was advancing in on them, and screaming at them, put the weapon down, swearing at them, and yeah. and he held the rifle in the air, so like the barrel was pointing in the air. And as you know, with you know, you've got to be very conscious of when you fire. Yeah. You've got to be an imminent, imminent, imminent threat. threat of death. So even in that circumstance, I was sort of second guessing myself, and then I had my weapon cocked. Then the first guy uh, put the gun under his throat, under his Chin pulled the trigger, shot himself. He hit the ground, and then I started moving in really quickly on the second guy because he wasn't at the weapon at that stage. Yeah. And I was screaming, him, "Get on the f- ground! Get on the ground!" And he went, picked up the rifle, didn't even stand up, sort of was crouching, looked me dead in the eye, put it in his mouth, and pulled the trigger and shot himself. Right. So he hit the ground. Uh, I ran in on him, picked up the rifle and threw it into the street. And it was the middle of winter, and he had a big sort of puffer jacket on. Yeah. And I'm standing over him. There was a lot of blood coming out of his out of his face. And he sat up and put his hand into his jacket. So I thought he was might have been going for another weapon. So right. I put my foot on his shoulder and slammed him into the ground. Had my gun at his at his forehead, and then he died. And so I sort of everything stopped. I turned around. There was a, a detective who had been in the vehicle that was shot at first up. Yeah, who was really uh, pretty impacted, mm. as we all were. But he was standing over the the driver who lived, ironically, 
and had him had his gun pointed his guy and he was screaming, you know, I'll effing kill you, you try to kill us. So he was obviously pretty yeah. impacted. I walked him around the corner, took his weapon off him and he calmed down and reholstered it and then we sort of went about hours and hours of homicide investigations and walkthroughs and different things. Yeah, uh, uh, quite a few things to explore on that. But, uh, yeah, we talk about about policing and people look at police and, well, they've got the blue uniform on and you've got special powers and all that. But uh, the first thing is you're human. Absolutely. And in a situation like that, the adrenaline's rushing and you talk about how things slow down. I've been involved in incidents like mm. that. And it does feel like, and I think you just become hyper alert to your surroundings, the smell, Absolutely. the sights, the sounds. Yep. Everything is just, you're so so focused on, on what's going on. You've had the car pursuit. You're metres away from a person. You're talking about, um, you know, is it justified to use mm. your weapon because he's got the weapon not actually pointed at you. Mm. These are the type of decisions that you're making in incredible, you know, circumstances and then you said you spent a lot of time with homicide well that was part of my role in homicide coming in to investigate critical incidents and and that and uh yeah you would have been uh potentially criticized or or worse if you took a shot at him and someone said well he didn't have the rifle pointed at you so there's a lot that you've got to process in a situation like that isn't it and absolutely mate and the the thing that haunted me that was really i think the job that kicked off ptsd for me but i didn't realize yeah so in the end um, the other two uniformed police that were in the vehicle on the mall both got um, bravery medal, like Australian bravery awards. I didn't yep. get anything for it, and not that I'm complaining about that. Yep. But it just shows because I didn't give statements, and that wasn't unusual. As I don't know what yep. your dog handlers are like when you work with them, but dog squad aren't renowned for being good at paperwork. Yep. So I, they chased me for statements. I didn't give statements. So I sort of dropped off the You're back pain, of that job. Pain in the ass. We oh, it's an absolute we, pain in the ass. We've got a better chance of getting a statement from the dog. That's than, uh, exactly you guys. right. Yep. But I used, yep. as you will love this one. Jeebs, I, I say to people all the time, I said I used to do all the dangerous police work and then I had a group of people like secretaries. They called them detectives. They did all my paperwork for me. <laughs> That's a fair pain. I, I can't hit back from that. I, I understand what you're saying there. And, yeah. and mate, what I in that particular job, like the stress of that, definitely. But the thing that haunted me was having yeah. not taken a shot. Yeah. And the reason that was, was and there was nowhere that I could have, that I could have done yeah. it safely. There's people behind the offenders when we're running down the mall. There wasn't the imminent threat when they were standing under the awning, but then it's second guessing yourself after that incident to go, what if they had a shot a police officer and killed them and I had a chance to take a shot and I didn't? Yeah. What if a member of the public got killed and I hadn't done my job? And that was the fear around that. And that that was really impactful because as you like I was a 24 year old kid. Yeah. And at the at that stage, I didn't understand how normal the fear was. Yeah. And, and terror, like it was, it was terrifying. Yeah, and you, you don't, you don't have those special powers that people just assume. Well, you're cops, you you know how to deal with it. But there's the human side of it, and you've seen someone, yeah, you know, two people put bullets in their head, yeah, kill themselves in front of you, or one attempt and the other one do it, and the horror of seeing someone shot in the head, then sitting up, and you've you've got to kick him down to the down yeah. to the ground with the blood everywhere and the yeah. type of damage that you get with a head headshot. So there's a lot to process and. It's also after the event, and you said you were second guessing yourself. I've been involved in shooting incidents, and and you do you think, well, what if that happened, or or what if I did this, and you don't feel good about it. There's not you you get the adrenaline, the rush, the high when it's resolved, mm. but then you've got a hell of a lot of time that you've got to think about it and process it. And it's interesting you say that you then went into the homicide office. Then you've got to justify what you've done. Absolutely. And it would be nice someone telling you that you've done uh, done something good or or like that, but it's not always the way it uh, plays out. And the irony is, I so I, I was supposed to finish at midnight and I didn't finish till 11 a.m. the next day. So it was yeah. walkthroughs and interviews. And I walked back into the dog squad office and my, my senior sergeant, my boss at the time, was a very hard man, yeah. good guy, but not the most emotionally connected human yeah. being on the planet. Yeah. And I walked into the office and and expecting some sort of ticker tape parade and a hero's welcome. Yep. And he sort of said, what are you doing? You're not yep. working. I said, I was in that job in the valley. He goes, yeah. what job? I said, were they, where uh, the baddies tried to shoot us all? Yep. He goes, I didn't hear about it. Who authorized your overtime? Mm-hmm. So he's, his first response was, who's paying for my overtime that hadn't been authorized? And I uh, had some choice words with him that I won't repeat on your show and left. And that was sort of the response. I, I know I know the feeling that that creates and mm. and the anger that builds up and and quite often we talk about incidents that happen and yeah you know, the trauma associated with it and processing it dealing with it but it's those type of type of reactions i, I was in a, a running an operation where a, a, a police officer was injured with a firearm and uh, a dog's attacked him and uh, he 
in defending himself, he shot himself. And that was, I was dragged through the coals over that. Mm. And it wasn't well done. Like I ran to the gunshot. Mm. Uh, you know, this bloke, we're in the middle of nowhere, collapse in front of me, blood all over his chest. And uh, we rendered first aid and looked for, look for the offender. And the only uh, comment I got from senior police officers, well, we're not going to, um, there's no uh, uh, charges against you or, yeah, basically yeah. saying we, we've cleared you. Yeah, but we'll thinking, basically say we can't find enough evidence, not yeah, even we've cleared we, you. We, 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 we've, we've cleared you. And mm. I'm thinking, how, how does that work? Mm. And then other shooting incidents where you've taken the homicide office and you've got to sit down and justify what you've done, which is understandable. I don't think anyone, uh, any fair-minded person wouldn't say that, uh, yeah, you've got to be able to justify justify your actions where someone's been seriously injured or killed. But there's a lot going on, isn't there? And, mate, and unfortunately I think policing... And I do a lot with military now. Military's yeah. similar, but a lot of soldiers say to me they it's a lot cleaner because mm. they're in a different environment. Their rules of engagement are very clear. They, even though you know it can be a guerrilla type warfare, yeah. they still have an idea who who the bad guys are. Yeah. For police, I think it's very much you are. I had a, a special forces soldier say to me recently. He said, "Cops go to war every day, but it's in your own environment." Yeah. And then you've got to be looking at so many different things. And it's the institutional stuff that I think really impacts police more so than the violence you see. Yeah. For me, the violence I saw, and there was a lot of it. Like I was in the dog squad. It was yeah. all no paperwork, high impact jobs, violent jobs. Yeah. I've had guns pulled on me n- n- numerous times. And that didn't really affect me as much as the institutional stuff of being investigated constantly for, yeah. you know, I worked really hard. So I had seven years of assault complaints because yeah. I caught some really bad guys. Yeah. And they wanted to fight. And, yeah. you know, so, and I was willing to. But then it was often you would catch people for whatever, you know, breaking enter offences or something. Yeah. They'd be through the court system, convicted, back on the street. And the complaint that they made was still hanging over your head as a police yeah. officer. Yeah. Right. That's- and that that's the stress I think the public don't understand for police. Yeah. And that's why I was on a podcast with a couple of uh, army guys recently and they said, why are all highway patrol guys assholes? And I said, I said "Well, that's a, that's a, re- oh, that's a reasonable not, not comment. Not that I agree with them, but <laughs> yeah. perhaps a reasonable comment." And I said, "Well, think for yourself. If all day, every day, your job is to walk up to the to the door of someone's vehicle who hates you, yeah, yeah, eight hours a day, people hate you, and you're, you're not bringing joy to people's life, are you? And police often aren't, right? Because yeah. you know, police officers don't turn up to your house and say, "Hey, thought we'd drop in for a cup of tea because everything's going well." I, it's interesting you say that because I always uh, felt that too. And, and when I got jack of police, I, I thought I want a job that I don't bring trauma or tragedy or yeah. something into people's lives because that that was that was my world. I, I was always talking to people when mm. if I'm if I'm talking to you, it's not a good situation. Someone's died or yeah. something's happened, and uh, yeah, times where you think wouldn't it be nice just to be a florist or something, oh, just to, yeah, doing something that uh, is not confrontational because that is policing. It is confrontational. And I'm what I do now. I love. I'm very fortunate that. You know, I do a lot of keynote speaking and one-on-one high-performance stuff for yeah. business owners or whoever, and I help a lot of people out for nothing. And I was talking to a woman on the way here this morning, and she was having some stressful stuff going on. I know her quite well, and I was helping her out with it. And she says, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're amazing at what you do. And then I hang up feeling really good. Yeah, yeah. You don't often get that feeling as a police officer. No, nah, it, it's it's few and far between because normally, yeah, you've upset someone. If your days are good, someone's someone's upset. And even for me in the dog squad, if it was a simple thing like a break in, a break in enter, yeah. to me it's just another job. To that to that family, it might be extremely impactful because it's they've had their house violated. Yeah. You know, and I think it's a thing that's very difficult for police to get is having that emotional vulnerability and connection to people. Yeah. And equally, I saw some police officers at a cafe recently and they were the uh, riot squad guys from Queensland and they all just stood there exactly what I would have looked at, like in all their kit, looking yeah. pretty hard and, and you know, not very approachable. And I was looking at members of the public and how they, there was a couple of people you could see wanted to go and say hello to them, but yeah. were intimidated. So it's almost like cops are very shut off because they don't want to talk to people because they think they'll whinge. Yeah. Decent members of the public probably don't have the courage to go and approach police who look really hard faced. So the only people that approach police are the ones that want to who do want to winch. So everywhere you turn, it's conflict. Yeah, I I, I learnt that towards the latter part of my career that um yeah law abiding citizens feel intimidated by police and yeah. they don't come into contact with police. And yep. sometimes when they actually speak to police and go oh right oh that that's all right. 
But uh, yeah, there's a certain way you carry yourself as a police officer, and you you, you have those battle scars on you, and you're mm. a little bit that barriers there, which is is a shame because I, I think if you, we bring the barriers down, it, it makes everyone's uh, world easier. Why did you get into the cops? What uh, what drove you? It, my dad was a cop for 42 years. Yeah, but um, I saw I wanted to do something that had an impact that made a difference. Yep. And my whole family, dad's got 15 brothers and sisters, good Irish Catholics. My pop served in World War II in Papua New Guinea and my nana was raised in an orphanage. So the um, there's a real, there's a lot of, you know, nurses or doctors and lawyers and cops and yep. you know, counsellors in, in our family. And I think it's a social justice sort of thing. It's that good yeah. sort of um, Aussie battler mentality. And I wanted to do something to help other people. Uh, Dad, being in the police, obviously had a huge impact. Yeah, he was um, very well recognised in in Queensland. Um, he was head of the police union for a period of time, as one of the most decorated, if not the most decorated, cop in Queensland for a long time. Very brave, courageous. So I yeah. grew up listening to his stories, just thinking this sounds like the best job in the world. Yeah, like they're paying you to do this stuff. Yeah, like so I had no interest in anything other than policing for the L- larger than life character and you seen his, his mates or work colleagues and that. And uh, yeah. It's interesting in your uh, in your book you talk about it, and uh, I haven't really explored this on the podcast because I'm normally talking to the cops, not their their kids. But uh, you you were troubled by it. You were proud of the fact that your dad was a cop, but because he was away so much or wasn't there, and as, as a young kid, and it's pretty raw. Your your book very open and, and honest, but you're talking about you felt like. Well, my dad doesn't love me. He's not for here sure. for me. He's missing my, my sport or not turning yep. up at school or or that type of stuff. Talk talk us through that being the yeah. kid of a cop. It, I'm really fortunate, mate, because I've seen it as the child of a police officer and then as a police officer myself. So I yep. think I've got a pretty unique perspective. And when I look at it as an adult male, at 52 years of age, I look at my dad and go, he was just obsessed. He's got an ADD, obsessive personality, same as me. Yeah. Or me, same as him. He was just obsessed with doing his bit. And yep. as you know, as a police officer, you can always do more. Yeah. So his focus was on being the best cop he could be. That's where he felt validated. He was doing something important. And so missing my sport mm. wasn't a big deal for him. And I'm sure, and we've spoken about it, he's not o- he's open, but he's probably not, I think it's still pretty raw. He's actually been very open and said, mate, I should have been a better dad. I wasn't a great dad. Yeah. But the thing for me was as an adult, I look and go, well, what he was doing was really important. Yeah. So I understood it. But that's the drama with a job like that is that it can just become all inclusive and obsessive. Yeah. Hence why so many divorces and so many, you know, problems with families for cops. As the kid, it was absolutely, I was looking going, oh, well, he doesn't love me enough. I'm not important enough for him to want to spend any time with me. Yeah. Which obviously as a young kid, that's your your insecurities, but you don't know any different. And if he had have been aware of that stuff, which, you know, he was, uh, I was born in 1970, he was born in 1946. So it's not like there was a lot of emotional conversations yeah. being had that, you know, you two weren't sitting down talking about your feelings. Exactly, mate. Yeah. Right? He, we weren't holding hands, staring in each other's eyes, talking yeah. about our feelings. Yeah. But I look at him now and go, he was just a guy that was extremely dedicated to his work. I didn't see that as his kid. Yeah, I would never have seen that. So that caused me a lot of stress and grief for a long time. But that was my like my own stuff. But again, I think it's just a job that, unfortunately, if you're a good cop, other parts of your life suffer. You can get sucked down that rabbit hole. I, I know I, I'm guilty of it, and since I've I've left the cops, I've had to go around and apologise to friends sure. and family and go, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't there and, and this and that. But it was the type of thing, and it made you feel good about yourself because you thought you were doing good work, absolutely and meaningful work, and so it would. I I could always justify in my mind, well, okay, I've missed my son's fifth birthday, or be, because I'm I'm on the job or I've missed Christmas because of this or, or that. You could justify it. But, uh, yeah, I can understand what you're saying from a kid's point of view that uh, you don't don't really see it that way. Maybe with the you know, um, time and when you become an adult and you can look back you know, with a more open, open view on it, you understand what your uh, father was doing. But there's also an embarrassment, uh, or my kids had it, when they – got to those teenage years, their dad's a cop. That's yeah, you, know, you don't want the cop, yeah, you know, when yeah, you, you're, I, you're trying to be the tough kid. And uh I was um I you know, it's very cliche to say, but I always felt very different to other people when I was a kid and yeah. when I was a teenager and now I get why. Yeah. Uh and it's just that drive to want to help people to do whatever and I've got a pretty obsessive personality. Now yeah. I didn't give a shit when I was a teenager. 
I was still really proud of what my dad did. Right. Okay. Because I was obsessed with the cops, right? At that yeah. stage, I was like, I've just got to get through school. Yeah. It sucks. I hate it because it's getting in my way. I just want to go to the police academy. That's all I want to do. And that uh, that came through in your book and uh, and just from our chats that uh, that was you were going to be a cop and nothing was going to stop you. Mm. And it. Um, in, in the normal part of the stories of my life, I was self-destructive in that. Like I didn't do any work at high school, got suspended yeah. for the last week of grade 12 for being a smart ass and, and essentially failed high school, had to go back to night school to get into the academy. Yeah. Like there was all those sort of things, but just loved it, mate. And I knew what I wanted from such a young age. It was a huge benefit, yeah. but also a bit of a, um, probably a poison chalice because look, I went and worked for a law firm for 12 months in between leaving school and going to the police. And there was a small law firm that again got amalgamated into a really large one. Yeah. And uh, I was a law clerk just going to court, filing papers or whatever. Yep. And the partner that I worked for actually said to me when I was leaving to go to the police, he said, don't leave. We'll pay for your law degree. We want you to stay here. We'll think you'll be a great lawyer. So a good offer. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I was like, oh, thanks. No, nah, I'm going to be a cop. And I'm yeah. going to be in the dog's court. Yeah. Because that's what I wanted. So I didn't even stop to even consider. Now I go, wow, what an amazing opportunity. At the time, it didn't fit my rhetoric, so it also was one of those things that, again, I go, oh, everything, life's hard, it's a struggle, mm. but they were offering to, to give me a free ticket. Yeah. But I still didn't see it. Didn't see it because you're driven by being a cop. Mm. How did you feel when you uh, when you got there, when you, you were accepted and got Ma- Loved it. Um, got in trouble. Like I loved it, but I got in trouble. I was a smart ass. At the um, academy? Yeah. Yeah. And because I'd been like 18 years wanting to get when i got there i was like oh this is awesome then quickly i thought oh shit yeah if i don't get through this there'll be some trouble so you know the physical stuff i was fine with you know firearms and Mm. driving and that was fine but legislation i I didn't have any interest in understanding the legislation so i did what i needed to but i had a couple of i think i failed one of the exams and the inspector um who was the boss of the academy pulled me in and said i don't you know i don't give a who your dad is or who my uncle was an assistant commissioner at the time yeah i don't care who your family is you're a smart ass. If you fail, I'll take great pleasure kicking you out. You know, I sort of walked out of his office. So like, it's a double-edged sword, really, having, really having was. family with a reputation yeah. that uh, it can be used for or against you. And there was different times. I uh, Straight out of my first 12 months, I got sent to the front counter at City Station for three months. Yeah. And to this day, I don't know if that was punishment or a square up for someone with my old man. So, But then yeah. I got into the dog squad because the guy that ran the dog squad knew my dad's reputation, so he took a chance on me. So... Okay, talk, I, I want to talk in detail about the dog squad because mm. uh, I, I think people are fascinated. We see see the dog squad. Uh, yeah, they they turn up at. Uh, you see any of the uh, really dramatic situations, and there's always a dog squad uh, there on uh, on standby or, or heavily involved. Tell us the role of the dog squad. So very simply, the way I describe it, it's it's uniform first response policing. But it is the most violent incidents. So I did a lot of work with CERT, like the SWAT team, TRU and yep. so else. Didn't do their selection or anything. As you know, it's very yep. important to be clear, but did heaps of jobs with those guys. The dog squad does those jobs normally as the as the tip of the spear, as wanky yep. as that sounds, when you're on the street because yep. you've got normal uniform police. Dog handlers go to a lot of those jobs. So the yep. dogs are used to chase and track human scent from any scene. Yeah. If you crash a car after you run from the police because you're drunk, your police would track you, like dog squad tracks you. If you've murdered someone, domestic, armed robbery, whatever violence, same thing. So the dog's primary role is to essentially, as melodramatic as this sounds, I was talking to the dog squad guys in Queensland recently about some leadership stuff and I put it this way and they all like, that's right. The dog's trained to drag you, the handler, into an ambush with an offender. Really, yeah. if you think of it, that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Because it's an animal. They're brilliant at tracking and getting to the offender, but they're not giving you updates. They're not like, oh, hey, they're 10 metres down here. They're 100 metres away. We're going to go crash, bang, straight in the middle So of you it. will often end up, and the dog's trained to follow the freshest human scent, so they'll follow the scent of whatever the person is. That's why. So the, the type of dog we're talking about in your dog handling role, because I, I think a, a lot of people would know the dogs, the sniffer dogs they see at airports yep. or, or you know, at uh, festivals, the, the police drug dogs and that. But these are these are dogs that you. If there's an armed offender in the building, you want to clear the building. You might be sent in, or your dog might go Definitely. in, and uh, you follow. So, so it's called general purpose dogs. So they track and they do bite work. That's essentially the two roles. So yep. is to track down the offenders to find them if they're hiding, yep. and then subdue them if they fight with the dog. So yep. the dogs are very good leveler 
if you go to jobs where someone's violent. Yeah. I've been to so many jobs where there's, you know, four or five police and you've got a, like domestics or whatever, you've got a big, hard, violent man. You turn up with a dog, often they'll just give up. They don't care about five cops, but they're scared of dogs. Yeah. And the dogs are trained like they're, they're a tool. And as, you know, people who love dogs get offended. But I didn't, I was terrified of dogs when I joined the dog squad, but I just joined it because I knew. a contradiction. Well, absolutely. But yeah. I knew you worked on your own. There was no paperwork and they did the, had the most fun. So it was just yeah. something I had to get over. Uh, but they're amazing animals and you get so close to them because so you're how, on your own. How, how, do you, how did you get in the dog squad? You, you apply and, and. Yeah. So I, I um, when I first joined the police, there, there was like dog handlers that were already in the squad, obviously. And I would just go to every job I could that they were at yeah. and pester them. I just annoyed them, just talked to them all the time. I want to get in the squad. I want to get it like from the minute I joined the police. Yeah. And one of the guys um, took a bit of a liking to me. He's probably two or three years older than me. And I went out with him on my days off and would just go out and do full shifts patrolling on my days off, go out and do dog training with him. And so then he went to the boss of the dog squad when the next spots came up. So and we got said, this nut we should look following yeah, me around. That, 100%. Yeah. yeah, we got yeah. this idiot who just won't stop annoying me. Yeah. Uh, and that's often how you got into the unit back then. Yeah. Because it was a, it was highly sought after. There was forty three general purpose handlers out of six thousand cops when I joined, and everybody wanted to do it. Well, a lot of people wanted to do it. Yeah. And so, my just my same obsessive personality, which I didn't recognise at the time, I just pestered. Yeah. Did whatever I had to do to get there. And really, if you want to get in at the, let's call it the exciting sharp end of policing, the dog squad is where to go. You, it, that's you, really you're it. You're all, all, always there. How do you, um, what sort of training do you do and what sort of training does a dog do? Yeah. So the, do you train together? Do they yeah, give yeah. you, yep. so you, you, you get paired up with a dog? Yep. So yep. you get your own dog. So mine was Khan. He was a, a 75 year old lady. Had donated him to the police at 18 months old because he kept digging holes in the yard and chewing his shoes. All oh, right. What, what breed? German Shepherd. Yep. Uh, they now breed them specifically yeah. for for police work. Back then, we just got reject dogs, so it was a lottery. You know, could have been anything. He was he was a brilliant dog, awesome tracking dog, not super aggressive, so he would put on a good show, but wouldn't do a lot of damage. So yeah. he put one guy in hospital over six years. We worked together. There was other dogs that put people in hospital often. Yeah, um, but he was brilliant. So you do a fourteen week training course where you're eight hours a day. Five days a week, tracking training, obedience training. So they're essentially training the handler and the dog at the same time. Oh, right. So you're going through as a team. Going through you're the literally. team. Yep. So they're going, this is how you train him to do that. This is how you do that. And you've got to pass that course or you get kicked out of the unit. Mm. It's pretty full on. Uh, and there's a lot of, back in those days, this 1992 I joined, the guys that were taking the courses were hard men. So they were like they were really tough on us. And it was good because it was the whole idea being if you ca if you don't have the courage to run through the dark in the middle of the night on your own with a dog to chase some you know someone yeah. who's violent, then you shouldn't be in that role. Yeah. Um, but you spend fourteen weeks and then you come out on the road and and the dog is essentially trained. But uh, it's and not, when you it's not really like, uh, when you you like I see the dogs turn up and dogs got reputation as the cops got reputation. Yep. A certain dog would turn up and you knew okay well this this. This dog's serious. Yep. He's a real deal. Others would turn up and uh, they didn't have that sort of uh, tough guy reputation. But you're on a lead. Or they're on a lead, I should say, not you. Yeah. You're, you're running the dog, <laughs> hopefully. The dog's on a lead and you're following them through. So they're picking up a scent or there's someone that's broken into a building. You yep. go in there. You've got the dog there. Have you got a command that you can just... Uh, a, a word uh, that says attack that person? Like yeah, so the, the Rouse was the... The command they use it was German for like run essentially like go get them. So it's not actually attack, but that yeah. was the word that that we used. Um, but then there's commands for them. You'll say seek if they put a. You'll see them with a harness on and yeah. their head down when they're tracking. Yeah. Seek tells them to to look at the scent. Um, find and speak if you're searching a building. So it's find the person and bark. Okay. So, so the, these are all oh right. So these are the commands that you you can because if there's someone there with, uh, armed with a knife or whatever, if you're letting them off, you want the dog to bring that person down. It's, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. It's, so it's like it's like you and I. If we're going to the door and there's someone, and I'm like, mate, we're going to go in heavy and we're going to you know get this guy. Yeah. Then you're like, right, I know what I'm doing. So the dog's the same because you know the dog could we could literally be turning up to search for a five year old kid who's missing. Yeah. So you don't want the dog going right. I'm out hunting down the. Human so that's being. a that's a find and bark command. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And you still got to be, like, if it's a five year old kid, the the dog's not going to attack it because it's there's no threat. Yeah. 
But, um, you know, if you're trying to find a mental patient who's who's been missing, someone who's got mental health issues and they're in the bush, mm. they might be violent when you get to them. Yep. you got to watch the dog doesn't attack them. There's a whole lot of nuance to it, but it's, uh, it's and what what fun. what sort of attack is it to go for the limbs or yeah? What? So what what they teach now is actually to to hit yep. the sort of biceps, hit hit up under your bicep, under your shoulder cavity. But back then it was just mate like arms, but mm. the dog just goes where it goes. So yeah. in a lot like they're not trained to attack your throat or whatever. People yeah. have all those ideas, and the idea isn't for the dog to do damage. The idea is for them to disable the person. Yeah. So it's so if you've you know we would you know, obviously put the training gear on and get attacked by them all the time. Mm. And it's an intimidating thing. You've got a 40 or 50 kilo German Shepherd running at you yeah. full on. You've got protective gear. It's still like it. It's it, intimidating. It is. Yeah. So if you're a bad guy and we catch you in the middle of the dark and it's normally you're on your own, so there's only you, the dog, and the bad guy, and, you know, the dog's barking at him, 90% of them will give up. Well, I've I've heard the bad guys yell out, "Help, help, help!" Like they're, they're screaming for you to get there. That's it, yeah. and it's and it's actually quite funny because it's um, you see some you know people who had you know people who raped women or yeah. domestic violence or violent people, and you would often you you're chasing the most violent people. Yeah. So you catch them at the end of these tracks, and it's you, the dog, and them, and you actually see what cowards they really are. Yeah. Because you know you can be a tough man and and you know belt your wife or something, and then when you got a police officer with the dog, it's it's often a good leveler. Yeah, yeah, you you're back backing away. Did you um have I I think in in your book you had a situation where you lost your dog very early in your career, but he was yeah yeah so, yeah, so, so that's uh, that one. It was actually funny when you said before what happens when you finish your course. Like it was we come out for six weeks and you do a um like basically a buddy type and mentor scenario. So I was with another guy for six weeks. He was yep. a great guy, but he was pretty, in my mind back then, pretty slow. He was just, had good common sense. Yep. But I thought he was a bit soft, so I couldn't wait to get away from him. So the first night I was on my own, you would he pick, he'd work 2 p.m. to 10 p.m., then pick me up at 8 p.m. and I'd drop him off and I'd work till 4 in the morning. Yep. Pick him up at 8, I'd go, oh, why don't you go home early? So I'd drop him home early. And then there was a job straight away, ironically, um, in the Fortitude Valley again, yeah. the next mall up, the Chinatown Mall from where the shooting was. And there was a breakers on premises call. So essentially someone's breaking into a building and they're still there. So they called the breakers on job. I was about five minutes away. I responded to it and they sent me their lights and sirens. And I'm driving there. And this is my first ever job, dog job with Khan, my dog. And the, the trainers say to you, when they get on the road, it's not like a switch flicks. It's not a robot. The dog still has heaps of stuff to learn. Yeah, I didn't listen. So I went to this job ran up the stairs into this um, recording studio and there was four bad guys in there and the owner. And the uh, the owner had only just gotten there and the bad guys were sort of, you could look at them and go straight away, they were uh, pretty serious characters. So yeah. they three of, the four of them were from Logan in Brisbane. Like okay, so they'll, Sydney. They'll, they'll fight if they've- uh, Wasn't their first yeah. radio, wasn't the first time they'd yeah. seen the police. I walked in the door and I was like, get on the ground, get on the ground and Khan's barking. Yeah. And three of them laid straight down on the, on the ground. Mm. And then the fourth guy, who was quite a big guy, sat in a chair. And it was one of those Namco chairs with wheels on an office chair. And I thought to myself, he's testing me. And yeah. if I don't get control of this, this it's going to go bad. So yeah. I stepped up and just kicked him straight in the chest, kicked him yeah. off his chair, get on the effing ground. Khan's going berserk. And then he he took umbrage to that, wasn't very happy. So he stood yeah. up and then the fight started. So the four of them are fighting me and the owner. But thankfully yeah. for me, they're just trying to get out. Yeah. They weren't trying to hurt me. Yeah. So I'm kicking and punching and Khan's jumping up, but he thinks it's a game because all the training you do with them, especially back then, they get rewarded with a tennis ball or a toy. Right. So he's like, this is the best game ever. So he's jumping up barking, looking for his toy. Tail wagging. Tail Just, wagging. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what the? So I was, I'm losing my mind. And they all sort of got past me. And then we're running out. There was sort of a, a footbridge and then down some stairs to the mall. And all I had in my mind was I've got to get that big guy. I didn't care about the rest of them, but yeah. I go, he's not getting away because he started the, the fight. Yeah. Well, I probably started the fight, but he he reciprocated. So as we're running down the stairs, Khan's running beside me, but I actually was such tunnel vision on the guy, I forgot about the dog. And as I ran, there was a Chinese restaurant and this guy ran around a garden bed and I launched off it horizontally and hit him, took him down. We had a pretty good fight on the ground, choke him unconscious, handcuff him. And then I sort of look around and go, oh, where's my dog? <laughs> And Khan's gone. And it's so there's two major roads on either end of the mall, like three lane, four lane roads. It's about nine o'clock on like Tuesday night or something. So there's a fair people around. I'm like, oh, he's going to get run over. Shortest dog squad career in history. Yeah. So then 
a couple of minutes later, and I'm calling for urgent assistance, and the nearest cars are five or six minutes away. There was no no units available. Then a vehicle pulls up with a mate of mine who I got sworn in the academy gets out and goes, uh, is that your dog? And in the back of his car is my dog with this one of the offenders. <laughs> and the, and Khan's sitting in the back like tail wagging, tongue out, happy do as good? Larry. Don't do good. <laughs> happy as Larry. And I was like, what the? I said, what, what happened? And he said, they'd come down the street, Wickham Street, and the bad guy was standing against the wall. Khan's sitting at his feet looking at him. The baddie's worried he's going to kill him. The dog's yeah. going to kill him. Khan's waiting for the toy. So he was sitting there waiting for the toy at the end of this great game that we've just had. So the the boys pulled up, opened the door, Khan jumps in the back, they put old mate in the back and they come back to me. Again, went back yeah. for de- the detectives interviewing the guys and they were, the detectives, the, the crims were all just giving me such a hard time. I was so, I was furious. No respect. No respect. <laughs> They're like, oh, great dog, mate. You know, I'm ringing my sergeant at like three in the morning just going, this is, I need a new effing dog. This is where, and he goes, I told you. Yeah. Just a very typical thing in my life, mate. No, not listening to what people say. So, how long did you work with that uh, dog for? Six years. And you, uh, when do you take the dog home? Yeah, lives at so, home. And do, uh, kids, family, or, or yeah, no, the I was dog single. Or? Yeah, I was single at that stage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the guys. Did take you feel them. comfortable with kids playing around the yeah. dog? And so I would like I'd work till four in the morning chasing bad guys. Yeah. Then I had um, a good friend of mine who was a cop. His his wife was ran childcare centres. Yeah. So uh, they would often sort of say, "Hey, can you bring the." The dog ran to see kids, so I'd finish at four in the morning. Where you know we're taking down bad guys and biting them, and yeah. then you know nine o'clock, I'm at a childcare centre with five year old kids crawling all over him. He was brilliant, like that. Yeah. Really switch on and switch off. They're clever, aren't they? Really, when, when yeah, you, amazing. You, you think of that. And did you get? I, I would imagine working with your dog that long, Khan. Yep. Um, you get a good relationship. Yeah, with him and, and synchronicity in the way that you operate. Yeah, he was. Um, you spend eight hours a day driving around on your own with the dog like it's yeah. it becomes such a strong bond and you're literally relying on him for your life and you'd be talking to him you do <laughs> yeah. like because yeah. and that's one of the biggest impacts i think for dog squad which i've realized post my career with ptsd and that is you literally go to these really violent jobs maybe half a dozen a night yeah if not more and then you're driving around on your own not with anyone to even debrief if you've got a part if you're a detective yeah. or a uniform cop You've got a part. You go. Oh, that was harsh. Yeah, it's, it's you're true. On your own. You, we really just throw you out there, and you got your dog, and uh, you're always travelling on your own, and stuck in your own head. Yeah, and um, you know, he never spoke back, which was probably a, that, a positive good. sign. But yeah. yeah, it was amazing, mate, and just really enjoyable from the point of view of you knowing. It sounds very harsh, but I always say, you know, policing, military, whatever. We recruit from the shallow gene pool that is general society. Yep. There are some not great people out there in general society. There's some not great people in the police. Yep. I was much happier to be driving around with a German Shepherd than stuck with some idiot for eight hours who I didn't like having to make small yeah. talk. Yeah. So that was an advantage. But very, very good bond. And he became, they get to the point where you can read them so well and they can read you so well. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Do you get to the point, uh, and I would imagine like you work with someone or you're close with someone, you, you don't want to see them injured? Do, do oh, absolutely. Get to, get to yeah, that yeah. point? Because quite often I see dogs. We're not going in. We'll send the dog in, and yeah. you know the dog's going in. He could face a bloke with a rifle, yeah. or, you know, a weapon or, or whatever. Did you get to that point? It, it oh, would have yeah. been. It would have been hard, and mate, it's hard. But it's their, their job. You can't sort of. And, oh, I want to protect him. And that's how I rationalised it. And I think dog handlers rationalise it. Is at the end of the day, even though I loved him, he was a great dog. Yeah, he was a tool. Yeah, like my firearm, like my radio, like whatever. He's he's a tool. And as sad as it is, if somebody's you know if there's a bad if there's a really violent individual that needs to be taken down mm. we're much better off risking a dog's life than a human being police yeah. officer's life so but it's still very challenging yeah. and i had yeah. incidents like that where i was like i don't want to send him in but i've got to because that's that's his that's job. his job but i would then and i think it most handlers are the same anywhere i was putting him in i was going to so yeah. there was there's two of you yeah yeah and um it's like I had a particular incident where they just become so switched on that you can't train them for, and it's a very long story short, but they, these guys break into a football club, and when I turned up, I went to the back of the club. I was the first one there, and I was going through. There was a, they cut a hole in the yeah. roof. I was going through the roof with the dog, and then uniform cops pulled up at the front, and they're on the radio saying they come out the front door. So it was yeah. two bad guys smashing out the front door. So I came around with him off lead, so he's just running beside me healing, yeah. and as I ran around the corner, there's it was an AFL. Um, club, yeah. So there was two AFL fields, and that's where you do a lot of training on open fields, like yeah. bite work training. So it couldn't have been more perfect. There was two uniform cops or two detectives, sorry, and a uniform police officer. 
and then two baddies and we're all running. So I'm looking at the three cops thinking, I'm yelling out, stop, they, they can't hear me. Yeah. Um, and Khan's beside me and I just thought, if the bad guys get through the oval and into suburbia, yeah. you're never as fast as them. And if they keep moving, you won't catch them. Yeah. So I, so I just let him go. So I gave him the attack command. He pinned his ears back and he just went. And I fully expected he was going to hit one of the police first. I yeah. thought he'd take one of the cops down. Then they'd stop and then I'd be able to put him on the on the crims. But he ran through these three police, put his ears back, ran through the middle of them a million miles an hour. And I was like, wow, I didn't think that had happened. Do you think they, they – they know. They know because I always worried when we're doing tactical jobs where the, the dog was there and you think, hey, I'm one of the good guys. Yeah, you're, that's you're, yeah. You're walking past the dog, look, remember me, I'm one of the good and, guys if shit goes down. And they do. Normally, I'll come back to that because there was he bit a couple of cops, my dog. But So he went through the three cops, took down the first bad guy, hit yep. him in the middle of the shoulder blades and took him down. Perfect. He was awesome. I see. And then I call him off. He looks at me and I just point and yell out Rouse again. And he looks and sees a second offender and wow. nails him. So that's clever. So he went it? over like a five foot fence onto yep. this oval and nailed the second guy. And I was so happy. So I go grab him, you know, I'm like patting him and giving him his ball. And we're r- yep. r- wrestling around with him on the ground with the with the dog. And the boys are looking after the, the crims. And then we go back and the cops are like, oh, mate. And Soggy's my nickname from my yep. initials. They're like, oh, Sog, that's amazing. Like, how do you, tra- how do you train him to not attack us? I said, well, I didn't. I said, I thought he was going to hit one of you. And they were filthy. You know, yeah. oh, that's, you know, what, what if he had a bit me? I said, you'd be fine, mate. And I said, yeah. like, it's not a big deal. But they learn. Yeah. And they learn. The dogs, they pick up, you know, people's energy and what they like. And so you can walk into a room and if there's someone who's violent, who's done something, yeah, the dog they're, picks they're, up. They're, they're very perceptive, aren't they're they? They're pretty switched they, on. Where the threat is. And, uh, and even smelling adrenaline and, you know, yeah. those sort of things. Yeah. But, yeah, my dog bit a couple of people. And it's normally they're really excited, yeah. And they're in a, it's almost like them just saying, "Hey, let me go." We, my dad and I actually did a job. We tried to pull over a car one night, and we were standing on the side of the road, and they tried to run us over. We chased them and caught them, yeah. and then I got the dog out, and we tracked them and found. Um, the so driver. this is you and your dad off, man, off yeah. duty. No, no, on duty, on duty. On duty. Yeah, yeah. So we're just standing on the side of a road, just talking. He was that would have been fun. Yeah, it was keep fun. it all in the family. We did a lot of fun stuff, him and I, like that. So we were standing on the side of the road just talking and um, this car came driving along really quick and I stepped out to wave it down and he slowed down and then accelerated at me and drove yeah. off. So we chased him and we caught him in the grounds of the Royal Brisbane Hospital. Yep. Um, and the car was there, doors open. So I get the dog and track and we didn't go very far and we found this guy in the garden bed and um, there was another cop who was a friend of mine, a uniformed cop with me. So I gave him the lead. He was holding the, the tracking line and the harness yeah. with Khan on it. And I'm in the garden and dragging this guy out and he's putting on a bit of a fight scene. Yeah. My, my dad and I are fighting this guy. And as he's fighting, like we get him under control and I just hear this scream. And I turn around and the friend of mine, his name was Jeff, really good guy. He's turned around and Khan's just bitten, like taking a chunk out of his leg. <laughs> and he's screaming like he goes, don't take the, the dog. And so you know, I said, let him go. So I'd let Khan go and I grabbed him. But he was so, Khan was so fired up because he could see me fighting someone. That he's more or less turned around, bitten him to go like, let me go, let me go. Ah, right. To and get, it's a get frustration and, to get yeah, to help me. Yeah. So he um like that. He was a very good friend of mine. That cop. He was like, he was blown up. I go, mate, we're in the hospital grounds. Like, just walk, you'll be fine. Yeah. So that would happen reasonably often. So with the uh, with the the dog did uh, Khan. Sorry, not the dog. Yeah, yeah. Your, your mate Khan. Yeah. Your buddy. Um, did he ever get injured on? Uh- yeah, mate. He got run over by a police car one night. Actually. Right. Um, we were searching. We were searching for an eighty-year-old lady who'd gone wandered off with dementia. Yeah, and I was standing on the side of the road, and we had a sighting of her. So, a uniformed car with a, a, another very good friend of mine pulled up for him to for us to jump in the back, and they're going to drive us to another location. And I was standing in a driveway of a service station, and as he pulled in, as a police car pulled in, he pulled into the driveway, and I yep. expected he'd pull up on the street. So, Khan l- l- like jumped out and got run over. Yep. So, I ran over his leg. Um, there was a lot of blood. I thought he was he was you know really badly yeah. injured. Threw him in the back of the police car, and then we went lights and sirens to the vet. He was fine in the end. Yeah, but um, yeah, he's fallen off a couple of roofs and things like that. And never got bad because I, I I think people and this is the side of policing people don't get to see at two o'clock in the morning mm. when uh, someone's broken into a warehouse or run away from a house that's been broken into or an assault that. The type of uh, environments you got to work in is, is quite often it's night time. A lot of your work yeah. is at, at night time, and you're literally. And I, I I'd watch this, and uh, yeah, generally you're behind the dog squad guys going in, 
okay, we think the offenders have gone into the bush there and you guys just take off with your, your dog and uh, run in there. And what you were saying earlier on, that uh, they lead you to the ambush. Yeah. And uh, they, they, they pick up a scent, but they run through the scent. And once they've lost the scent, they sort of then stop Come and back. look. But by that time, they're probably taking you right beside. Absolutely. Talk us through that. Explain so, that. So you run the dog. The dog has a harness on when it's tracking and there's a just a piece of like a 30-foot piece of rope that's on the back of it that you hold on to. Yeah. And the whole idea is you can't run what well, you can't, but it's stupid to have a torch because then you light you yourself, yourself up as a target. target. Yeah. I didn't realize at the time, but I've got really bad night vision. I can hardly see at night, but right. I didn't know that. I thought no one could see at night. So I would literally <laughs> just be running in the dark, can't see feeling what the dog's doing yeah. to get really in tune. But they will run through – think of a think of um, like Charlie Brown, you know, I come, the character that had all the dust and that around the him. The bubble around him. Yeah, the, the guy that was the smelly kid, yeah. I can't remember. That's essentially what we're like. As you're walking along, there's a bubble of scent, like yeah. dead skin cells, smell, perfume, whatever. Now, when you're lying somewhere, that builds into like a, into a bubble. Yeah. So the dog will hit that scent and then as it gets the bubble of scent, They'll run out the other side of it and realize they've lost it. Gone past it. And then they'll cast themselves back around on that line. So yeah. they'll run. But often they will literally be out the scent bubble. By the time they stop, you stop. I couldn't tell you how many times the offenders were right next to me. Right. You okay. know, and, and often even they might be like hidden in the bush or where you yeah. can't see them and you're not putting your torch on to look. Yeah. And the, you know, Khan or Duke, my other dog, had later would will circle back around you and then find the guy like right next to you. And they'll come in, start barking and growling or whatever, and someone will scream and you'll put the torch on and they're six feet away. And the but they've stopped you right next to them. But you yeah. don't know. How long how long did you just have the one dog? So I had him for six years and then I had Duke, another dog, for about a year and a half. How how was that changing uh, changing what what happened to Khan? Did he retire or Yeah, so he retired. Took an early pension or Yeah, so yeah. he um he had really bad hips for right, like okay. as a lot of shepherds do. Yeah. So he retired about eight or nine. One of the the cert, the police tactical SWAT guys, his girlfriend took him. Oh right. Because um, I was gonna say what happens because yeah. You, you, you yeah. Often you keep uh, like most guys are married with kids. Yeah. Uh, I was the second youngest guy to ever get in the unit at that stage yeah. with a good friend of mine. So I didn't take him because I was a single yeah. guy. And yeah, you didn't have a Just didn't have him. the time yeah. for him. But he went to um, this guy's girlfriend and she loved it for years. Like, so he lived happily oh, ever after. Lived, sleep, t- sleeping tell in her bed. T- like, telling, telling war stories. Oh, when mate. I was a cop, I arrested this so person, that I never person. went. I never went back and saw him after I gave him to her because it was, it was pretty emotional. Yeah. But also I was like, I'll walk through the door and he'll kill me because he'll go, I'm not going back to work with you. I'm here sleeping on the bed. Like it's, it's a much better <laughs> life for me. Yeah. But yeah, you get really close to them. Yeah. And so your second dog, d- different Duke, pers- yeah, pers- m- personality or m- different style? Very different. Um, I left the unit. So I had another one. Nico for about a year. So I had Khan that I trained. I took Nico, another dog that a guy trained and couldn't get anything out of, and I worked hard, got him on track. He was awesome. Yep. I went to surveillance for a couple of years. Then I went back to the dog squad and trained Duke. So he yep. was my last dog. He was really scared when I got him He because um, he's still a donation dog. Yeah. He'd run away like he was had no courage. So I built that up in him over about six months when yep. I was still at surveillance. So yep. I was at surveillance with a ute driving the dog around in the back of the ute when I was at surveillance, like yeah. stuff I shouldn't have been doing, but um, trained him up and he was awesome. So he was really aggressive. Right. Uh, he would chew on the cage to want to get out of the car at people and really good tracking dog yeah. again. And we went to Logan, so like Mount Druitt. So he was awesome. Just uh, different and personality. Did they know when they were on? Do, oh, do, yeah. do they know, okay, this is – Work time. They can tell from your definitely like you get ah, your your in, your demeanor. Yeah, but Khan and Duke as, as well, but Khan especially because I spent more time with him. The minute I'd start driving fast, if he was asleep, the minute he felt the car accelerate, he would ah. stand up and start whimpering and barking and He'd know it's spinning on. in his kennel. If you put the siren on, he would lose his mind because he yeah. knows you're going to a good job. Yeah, um, it was it was so funny, mate. Like they read they can read it. Yeah, so we'd be you know we'd be driving around, he'd be asleep. And then there'd be a, a radio call and I'd answer the radio call and just my tone of voice or whatever, he'd be up. I'd look in the mirror before I'd even start accelerating, look in the mirror and he was up. He'd know. They they feed off you so, yeah, it's pretty Yeah, intense. I suppose a little indicators that they'd know uh, game, game on. They're, uh, they've been used in the military a lot in war zones yep. and that. And I saw the benefits in police, but the, there is a real benefit having a dog. It's a good tactical uh, yeah, 
Well, mate, they, there's option that you have. Well, it's a great intimidation factor. Mm. So it it often diffuses violence, but also most people are scared of being bitten by dogs. Yeah, so, it's that primeval. Absolutely, yeah. and then in a military sense, their dogs are, f- are are used a lot for attack work, more so than tracking. They don't yeah. do a lot of tracking work. But again, it's that you can put them into a building, and you know now they've got cameras and things on them, so you can put the dog into a building that can search it. See yeah. when it, where a bad guy is and come out, so then you can go in more tactically. Yeah. So this this so yeah brilliant. A lot tool. better than trying to put the robots in the building. Yeah, and, that's uh, right. I, I've done that. And yeah, the wheel, me come, too. wheel wheel comes off and you then get stuck in the doorway. <laughs> yeah, you, you may as well walk in yourself with the camera <laughs> yeah, by right. the time time you get in. Look, I, I think we'll we'll start to wrap up on uh, on part one. Yep. I wanted people to get a real sense of that. That was your career in uh, in policing. Yeah. And. You're at the sharp end of policing, mm. like yeah, to your own detriment. I mm. think there's there could have been easier paths in uh, in policing, but wherever there was um, there was something going on, you seem to uh, stick your uh, stick your nose in. It was very much like I talked about my old man being yeah. obsessed. I was the same. Yeah, I'd go to work on my days off. I um, there was because I did a lot of work with the SWAT team. There was a job where a guy was in a house, had a hostage. On the opposite side of Brisbane. Yeah, it was Friday night, six o'clock. I was at home watching the news on a day off. Saw it. Grab the dog because you you've got the yeah. gun, your car, and the dog at home. Please go at home. Yeah. So I just called myself out, drove across Brisbane in peak hour traffic to this job. And when I got there, the tactical commander of the job goes, "What are you doing here?" And yeah. I said, "Oh, thought you might need me." There was two of us who did yeah. the work at the time. He's like, "You're not working." Who called you out? And I was like, "Oh, I guess I sort of did. I saw yeah. it on the news." He wasn't very happy. Told me to go home. Mm. I went parked around the corner and thought, "I'm not going home." So I cl- like put my vest, got the got can. Crawled through the backyards into the inner cordon with all the tactical boys, and I had my comms and everything. And I got in there and I was like, "Don't tell anyone I'm here." And we were there for 13 hours. This guy was firing yeah. shots over our head. It was raining. We're in the mud, and I was like, "This is the best job in the world." Yeah. We took old mate came out in the morning to get a pizza, and we put the dog on him, took him out, took the gun off him, got his hostage out. It was a domestic situation. Then I walked out straight into my boss, yeah, or the tactical commander, and he was like, "I t- like just abused me." Yeah. And so I'd work 13 hours. He goes, I'm not paying your overtime, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like he, and I was like, Don't I care. pretended I, yeah, I pretended I was really upset. Yeah. I'd never put an overclaim form in, in my life because yeah. I, I didn't want to be in the office doing paperwork. I wanted to be out doing police work. Yeah. So it was that sort of, it was just obsessed. Yeah. But it was awesome. It was so much fun. Yeah, uh, and look that that obsession, and uh, I, I think, and what we'll talk about in uh, part two, how uh, part of that obsession leads to your detriment because Absolutely. you started to realise that uh, you were um, changing, changing as a person, and uh, yeah, becoming hyper alert to everything because mm. you've been confronted by that much. But I think it's important that people get a sense of the type of things you see or do, and the story that we start off at Fortitude Valley, mm. yeah. That is like if it happened on the movie, you think it'd be made up. It sounds too, yeah. too dramatic, but that is what actually happens in in policing. But in uh, part two, we'll talk about how your life spiraled to the point where you're contemplating suicide. Yep. Um, and I really appreciate you talking about it because I think if people don't talk about it, we don't understand. Uh, yeah, what you've gone through. But as I said, we've um, I catch killers. We like stories of redemption, and I think it's really impressive the way you've turned things uh, around from your uh, your low point. So thanks, Gary. We'll, we'll take a short break, and when we're back to part two, we'll uh, we'll dive into that. Great. Cheers. <laughs> 